brushes. I've seen so many students in the years freak over about brushes uh, and they tend to think, oh, I've got to get the very best brushes because the better the brush means the better art will produce. Well, to some degree that's true. Uh, there, if you get a really poor brush, you'd not be able to um, do a, a straight line. Um, but by and large, all the brushes are pretty much the same. And I'd, I'd give a long lecture, I would say, I'd mention all the sort of brushes that are available and talk about the different sort of hairs, where they come from. You know, sometimes it's pony hair from inside their ears and generally it's from pigs from their back. Uh, but there's squirrels and there's all sorts of other animals that give up their lives. And then there's also all these um, synthetic brushes that you can use too. So I spend normally a, a fair amount of time looking at brushes, but to get right down to it, it's really, there's more important things than the brush. And where you're going to be is you're not going to have a lot of choice in what sort of brushes you have. So I'm just going to keep this really, really simple and talk about the most basic brushes. We have two kinds of brushes. We have flats and rounds. Now, it's going to be pretty simple to work that out. Um, and all the brushes I'm showing you are all dirty and used. Right? So this is a number 10 flat. Um, so that's a particular size. This one's um, uh, hog hair. So flat because it's flat. Now, there's different sizes in flats. You know, here's another one. This is another one that's size 12. Now, even though there's supposed to be a system of, of numbering, represents a certain width, it always doesn't often go like that. So I'm just picking up some at random, right? This is a number six. Um, what have we got over here? Um, six, whatever. Another six, but this one's slightly different. Now how this one's different is, it's got a stumpier sort of uh, uh, head on it. See that? So this is much longer than others. So there's a difference between that. What you want to look for is, and, and some manufacturers put a kind of glue on the, on the head of them to make sure they all look, all the hairs look straight. So you've got to try and find one that doesn't have all that glue on it, or try and take the glue off by putting it in water or giving it a bit of a flick. You want to make sure that the brush hairs are all reasonably straight. Now, they're not all going to be perfectly straight from, um, from pig hair, hog hair. Uh, some are going to be all over the place, but you want it to be as, um, as straight as possible. So any, any brush that you get, particularly any small brushes like this, and the hairs are all over the place, you don't want those at all, because you can have no control whatsoever. They're pretty much useless. So out of the flats, what you're looking for is a variety of different widths, right? So a big brush like that can't do fine work. So you've got to go that size, or even smaller, 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 right? Uh, they're all much the same, so get whatever's cheap, uh, whatever you can afford. So, they are flat. Now, they are for doing particular kind of strokes, and when I do a demonstration with painting, I'll show you the kind of stroke that it'll do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a flat area. Uh, now we have rounds. Now, I've got some big fat rounds, like this one here, that's a number 10, but they go way, way, way down, you know, tiny little things like this. Now, I use those for drafting, doing rounded... Uh, for drafting things up and fine, often fine lines. Now, they're also made out of hog hair and uh, you can use these with acrylics and oils. And all brushes, even when they get really old and daggy, are useful for all sorts of different techniques, which you'll find out yourself. Now, there are soft, a lot of soft brushes uh, around. And when I come to do a demonstration, I'll show you the difference between those. They are a lot more expensive, they're synthetic, uh, but they do a slightly different job. But at the moment, uh, Get whatever brushes you can, but don't spend a fortune on brushes. And, and there are brushes like these called fan brushes, um, and they're advertised for doing, you know, washes and blending and whatever. You can do a lot of that without spending a lot of money on these sorts of brushes. You can do it just by your own skill. Uh, if you can afford little rollers, fantastic. If you can afford a uh, range, any of these sort of brushes. But, you know, a brush that's really useful is even a toothbrush like that. So, it's a matter of using whatever you have. Now, of course, if you're going to do fine lines somewhere, fine detail, in the end you have to do, use things like that sort of brush. Um, but if worse comes to worse, you can even make your own brushes. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to demonstrate how you make, make them, but you can even make your own brushes. So, there's a wide variety of uh, brushes that I use here. Some you want to really avoid. Some of these cheap ones wear the hairs when you get the 
um, when you get the glue out on them, all, all the hairs go all over the place, they're pretty much useless. Okay, so that's really in a nutshell. Give a, a, a range of brushes, but um, look, probably you could do the general painting with probably a dozen or less brushes. You don't need to spend a fortune, right? Just a few different sort of sizes, like this, or like that, coming down to fine things like that. That's all you need. Keep it simple, keep it cheap. Oh, and with your brushes too, once you've been painting with them, um, don't leave them overnight standing up in water because two things will happen. Often the hairs on the brushes will bend and be out of shape, so you don't want that. Um, and also, a lot of the, the stems will um, get water in them and start peeling off the coatings on there, so don't do that. So, when, as you, while you're painting, um, during the day, yes, you can have it stuck in water, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that they're washed out and dried and uh, that the hairs don't come in contact with another surface and get bent out of shape. That's really important. Now, I'm ready to talk about paints. How I store my paints is I don't write the type of paint uh, that's on the outside of all these boxes. I just put little dabs of the colours that are in there. So that saves me writing down all the names all over the place. So in my, um, I've got a big rack over here and it's got all the blues together, all the greens together, all the reds and so on. Okay, now normally, as I've said in the past, um, <clears throat> I would give really long lectures about all this sort of stuff uh, in great detail, but I'm not going to do that because I don't think that's really necessary. I'm just going to tell you the bare bones of what I know about that particular material. And I'm going to keep it simple and cheap. So, for example, paints. Essentially, with acrylic paints and oil paints, it's got the same ingredients. So we have pigment, and the pigment could be artificial or it could be um, uh, organic. Uh, so it's a pigment that's ground up and put in with uh, normally a dryer, uh, something that will help dry it. Often it's got a bit of a varnish in there or whatever it might be. So I'm going to show you two kind of ways that paint can come to you. It can become come to you in containers with it being all wet, but it also can come to you as a powder. So we'll have a look at that. Now, you can get a colour chart, and the colour chart we'll call, let's say, uh, <clears throat> uh, in one particular brand, Thalo Blue. That's the name of the particular paint. That's the one I've got here. And Thalo Blue in one brand might look very different from Thalo Blue in another, right? So the, the name of it may not correspond with a particular colour that you're after. So you've always got to look, for, look at the colour. So uh, go into the shop, have a look at the colour, put a little bit on your finger and decide that's what you want. But if you're buying things um, through somebody else or buying it on the internet, often the colour that you think it's going to be may not be that. Um, now in this case, it says here a couple of things to read on the packaging. This one, and this is brilliant paint by the way, this is called Chroma, it's made in Australia. It's called, it says up here, transparent. Okay, transparent, you can see through it. Right, so that may not be the sort of paint that you're after. You might get have, might have to find one that's opaque that you're not going to see through it. Right? Um, in some instances, there might be a need for this particular paint, a transparent paint. And I've used it when I'm using uh, some different fancy materials if I want to make it a little pearlescent paint or do something different with it. So you've got to look at whether it's opaque or transparent. Now, also. You got to read the back because um, some of them will say whether well, it's fugitive, or, or, or they may not even say it's fugitive. They might give it a rating of how light fast it's going to be. In other words, some paints are going to fade a lot quicker than others. So you can get two kinds of paint that almost look the same, but one's going to last a lot longer than another. So that's really important to look at. Now, paint generally comes in a tube like this. Um, look, all the manufacturers pretty much are all pretty good. Um, if it's, if it's from paints from America or Australia or England or Germany, normally pretty good, but there's some other countries that make paint that isn't quite so good. Um, but it's cheap, but it's not good. Now, 
some paint is a lot more expensive than others. So, for example, and the reason for that is because if it says professional or student grade, it's not too bad, but sometimes it might say something like junior paint or, or, or not say anything at all. And those particular paints have less uh, pigment and they have a lot of water in it. So you're paying for a lot of water, you're not paying for a really good quality paint. So you've got to look at the back of it and, and read a little bit about it, maybe even go online and see what people think about that. Once you find a good brand, stick to that brand because normally the paints are pretty good. So paint can come into a tube like this. Um, and as I say, there's normally a, a code on the back to say how light fast it is or what pigment's been used and so on. It'll say whether it's toxic or not. The good thing about acry acrylic paints is it's pretty much all non-toxic. So if your kids happen to pick up and just eat a little bit of it, it's not going to kill them. Um, so on all these tubes, Atelier, that's another Australian brand, very good brand. It says the name of the paint, um, the series that it is, that tells you how expensive it's going to be, whether it's going to be light fast or not. But you can also buy paints uh, in bulk, and that's often the better way to go. The, but the problem with that is you don't know what sort of paint you're going to be using a lot of. Um, let's have a look at a couple of other variations here. Uh, now, some paints are satin, and some paints are gloss, uh, and some are matte. So you've got to decide, mm, do you have it all gloss, do you have it all matte, or satin? If you happen to mix them all up, it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, so, out of all the blue paints that I've got here, I've got uh, some that are, are transparent, some that are opaque, um, lots of different sort of names of these particular blues, all different sort of containers, they have all slightly different qualities. Um, you can buy paints like this in that sort of medium so size, that's quite a, an economical way to buy it as well. Um, Shortly I'll show you a chart. So what I do is when I've used my paint, I, I put it on a chart and name it, the brand, and, and um, mix it also with a little bit of white. Now on that, you can spend a fortune on, on white acrylic paint. Uh, and that can cost you a lot of money. Or what you can do is, the paint that you use, that I used um, a moment ago, on the sealing paint, you know, sealing that paint as long as it's water-based, you can use that as your white. Um, now, often what that does do though, is it makes all your paints kind of a little bit more matte, a little bit less shiny, but it's so cheap because you use a huge amount of white paint, so maybe you consider that instead of using white paint that comes in a tube that costs you a lot of money, use white ceiling paint that comes from a big can that's, oh, I don't know, one fiftieth of the price. Um, now, what I was looking for through here, oh yes, here's some, uh, you can get acrylic paints in little tubes like that, that that's a very expensive way to buy it that, that may be all you can get there's other paints that you can get uh, that uh, have a pearlescent sort of view on them uh, look to them, I've got one there, there there's another one here called interference and that sort of interference paint is at a different angle it can be seen as a different sort of colour um, so the colour kind of changes but look you're not likely to get that sort of paint um, you're just after some very basic acrylic paints. So it's a matter of whatever the local store has, has on offer. But once again, check the colour that you're after. Now what I'd recommend with all this, and it, look I could show you all my different paints there, the, all the ochres, the reds, the blue, you know, whatever. It's all going to be the same. Uh, how it operates is the same. And in my demonstration I'll show you how to, how to use it, how to look after the paint and what to, what to do with it. Um, but it comes down to what's locally available. Now, um, you can, and I'll, I'll stop the camera in a minute and go and set this up, you can buy paint that comes in um, as a powder, but to, to make that work, you've got to use a thing called a binder generally. There are some cases where you can get the powder and you just add water to them. Now, often that paint is called um, poster paint and it's kind of a little bit like this one here it's a very flat looking sort of paint but the good thing about that sort of paint is that you can paint paint it and if you don't like it often you can paint on it again and it covers it really really well but that's not a shiny sort of paint that's called a poster paint so where you are um, and you might have seen this when you're at school or primary school they used a lot of poster paint so it comes in big containers it's it's just pigment it's dry pigment 
uh, a powder and you mix that with water or you mix that with water and some other things. So we'll have a little look at that in a few minutes. Uh, what else can I tell you? There are some fancy things that you can buy in acrylic paints, but really we'll just keep it all basic, okay? This is just one of my colour cards that I have. Uh, as you can see, lots of, uh, lots of colours. And I write up the top, the brand, Atelier, Dulux, um, Atelier, Global, Liquitex, lots of different brands. And then what I do is I put with my finger, I put the colour from the tube straight on here. And what I can tell straight away is whether it's transparent, translucent. See this one here, um, it's a bit hard to see probably from where you are, but it's not a strong colour. And uh, that's, that's one that you probably want to avoid. But when I mix it, then I get, I get the same paint, I mix a bit of white with it and I put it next to it. So that paint, that paint there when it's translucent or transparent, when it's mixed with white, it's opaque. So it's amazing how these colours change with putting a bit of white with it. So for example, this one here, Burn Humber, look at the change when it goes to white. So that's what I do. And this is a good reminder when I'm coming to paint something, um, I, uh, I know exactly what sort of paint I'm going to reorder. Now the other thing is, why it's important to do a chart like this is because you don't want to buy a whole lot of paint that you're not going to use. And so it's worthwhile when you're, um, you're planning a painting to work out exactly what colour so you're not spending money on the colour that you'll probably never ever use. So just keep to some ba very, very basic colours. Uh, now why I use so many is because different colours and variations is because I have lots of different exhibitions about different sorts of things. So I have glow in the glow in the dark paints, I have a lot of metallic paints, I have rust paints, I've got all sorts of things. Um, but really most of the time I'm just using my standard sort of sort of colours. Uh, and you'll find you'll have a what's called a palette, your own preferred colour scheme that you like and you'll stick with those sort of colours. Uh, I'm not saying they are always the best, sometimes it's good to get other people's opinion and change the colours that you're using. But anyway, coming back to this, uh, it's important to, um, to have something like this, a bit of a record. It doesn't need to be a great big thing like this, it could be just A4, and in fact I used to encourage my students to uh, have a little A4 sheets and keep them in folders. A good little habit to get into too is um, do test things like this, where uh, you put down some sort of colour and then you put other colours on top of it. So I've got lots and lots of examples like this, and then I can say, oh yeah, that's great with this or this, or that doesn't particularly work. Um, that's not a high priority, it's not something I would always say with my students do this, but it can be helpful and it can be a reminder of what colours you use when and how it worked. Danger, danger, danger! One thing I forgot to tell you before about colours is something that's really, really important, and that is, if you like magenta, and that's a colour like this, uh, that is a colour that initially stains, not always, but stains, so once you put it somewhere it doesn't come off, but it's also one that we call futurity, and that means it fades very quickly, right? So, oh, that sounds a bit confusing, but it's a colour that, um, colour similar to this, and it could be more red or it could be more purple, uh, but it's a colour that fades very quickly in sunlight, so be aware of that. But a lot of magentas, and uh, a lot of yellows too, by the way, uh, can fade, so you've got to be careful of that, really, really check if you're going to use that, those sorts of colours, and if you're going to use colours like that outside particularly, they are going to fade big time. But the big concern is ones that are in the magenta, so, not magenta, in the sort of purple line of things. Um, many purples, many colours like this, in that sort of range, purple, violets or whatever, uh, they are shocking for staining, so, oh, Give an example. Uh, you could do a painting, and you're doing a painting, and you go, oh, I think I'll throw it down a particular purple. You put the purple down, and you go, oh, I don't like that now, and you try and take it off. Even when you paint over it, uh, white several times, often that, that colour will still keep on seeping through, seeping through, so no matter what you do, you can't fix it, and your painting will be totally wrecked. Uh, so that's called bleeding. And so there are some paints that you can use. One, one paint that I use is called Target, and I paint over it if I've made a mistake. Uh, but in some, some of those kind of purples, you'll never get rid of it. That just keeps on coming through. Shocking. So what I'm saying is that if you happen to find 
uh, that you're using some purples, make sure they don't bleed and be very mindful of that. Um, and don't and do some tests. To find out whether you can you can paint over it or not. Because as I say, many purples like that, violets, purples, uh, just keep on coming through, and you want to avoid that at all all cost. Uh, even, even if you paint it in black, I've seen where some of these purples have just kept on coming through the black and some of these kind of magenta purpley colours keep on coming through no matter what you do. So avoid that too. Some colours will, um, some reds, some other colours will fade very, very quickly. So you've got to be mindful of that, that you want a colour that's not going to fade um, because particularly in the tropics, paints can fade very, very quickly. If you go for the very dark colours, the ochres and the browns or whatever, you're pretty safe there, but when it comes to the really bright colours, often they'll fade very, very quickly. You can come in a liquid form, in a container, a tube or whatever it might be, but it can also come in, too, come in as a powder. So in this case, this is a particular powder that's made in Melbourne. It's a gold colour. And as I've said, most of the time paint's just made of two things. It's made of a binder, something to hold it all together, um, and, and the pigment. In other cases, there's also varnishes and dryers and other things. But essentially, that's it. So I'll just show you how that might work. So we get a little bit of colour. Um, and in many cases, the advantage of the powder, apart from that it's um, really light and, and therefore it's going to be cheaper for you to get probably in your village if you can get a hold of it, um, is that you can make the paint as strong or as weak as you like. So I'm mixing that powder with this one here. Now this is called an acrylic binder. You can get binders also for oil paints. Uh, this is an acrylic binder. So put a bit of that in. It says to be mixed with pigments. So I've got my little pigment there. And just have a look. Look at the luscious colour. Just look at that. Uh, and that's all you need. Just mix that up and often the colour is much more vibrant than the paint that you get in the tube. Now, the reason for this is, and particularly I won't mention any certain countries, but there's certain countries that put in a whole lot of filler in their pigments. Instead of their pigments being really pure and bright and strong, um, they put in all this other sort of rubbish material, and you want to avoid that. But when you mix up uh, your paint from a good manufacturer, uh, there's our luscious gold, it's pretty awesome. Uh, we wash our brushes out in the same way, straight in water, but that's the advantage of using um, some powder, some dried pigments like that. And uh, there's no point in me showing you all the different colours, it all works the same way, so let's keep it simple. Now to use your paint you need a palette, that's what you're going to do your mixing, you need your paint brushes, you need your support, you need your painting surface, but you also need water because water is what thins the paint uh, and also takes the paint out of your paintbrush. Now, regarding the containers, look, I use uh, plastic jugs, I use things like this, um, any sort, all sorts of containers. Now, I prefer to use plastic ones because if it falls on the ground, it's not going to put glass everywhere. It's totally up to you. If I go out in the bush or paint, Outside, uh, obviously I'm going to take a large container, often I take a bucket because the bucket's really easy to have, have beside me. So it's totally up to you. So that's all the painting materials. Your painting brushes, uh, your, your, your pigments, uh, your palette, your brushes, that's it, that's it. You don't need much. And uh, your easel, and we're, we're all done, we've covered all that.